One of the stages was uh, 60 hours, 60 hours, and that was in the Andes. But you see, if, if it was things like that nowadays, it would be on every paper, in every magazine, on every bit of social media. But like back then, they sort of said, oh yeah, yeah, 1,600 miles across there. <laughs> you know, nobody sort of, well, I certainly didn't think very much about it. I thought, yeah, that's a bit of a distance, all right. <laughs> play by play on Sports Joe and Her, brought to you by AIG, in support of 20 by 20. It's a new week, it's Bank Holiday Monday. We're jo joined by a living legend behind the wheel, uh, Rosemary Smith. Um, we've upgraded again, so Neve McElroy is not with us, but we've got someone with even better fashion sense than her. Uh, rally driver, Rosemary Smith. Rosemary, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. I, I love these shows, actually, I really do. And, you know, I just waffle on, so don't worry, ask me whatever you like. And oh. I, I don't care. <laughs> Genuinely, no, I don't, because, you know, if I know all the questions beforehand and then I'm thinking again about, you know, what I'm going to say, no, I prefer to just, you know... See. Just, just see what happens, yeah, see what I just, come out with. Just ask what you want to ask. As I say, I have no secrets. Most of the world know now what I do, and if I say something out of line, then, you know, they come down my head. Like, I, I somehow don't think if you say something out of line, it doesn't ruffle your feathers too much, no, though. No. no, you're made of quite tough stuff. It's not even that. It's just the fact... I did, oh, years ago, I couldn't. I couldn't have done this. There's no way I could have done it. I was so shy. And it's only in the last <sighs> number of years that I really came out of my shell and... I, I can sort of say what I want to say, you see, and also the old age business, it's great. <laughs> it, no, it really is, because uh, on uh, the 7th, two days' time, I will be 82. So, Congratulations. Know, yeah, well, this is the whole point. So, I mean, at this age, if I can't say what I like, and I'll come on. <laughs> so what have, what have you gotten away with now that maybe you wouldn't have gotten away with 10, 20 years ago? Just the way I, I speak and the way I talk to people and so on. No, I don't mean it in a bad way, but, you know, like I, I told the nice man putting on the microphone, you know, don't take pleasure in it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's ridiculous, but that's just me now. It's, and, you know, I can say really, and, but I give a lot of talks now, and a lot of it is on, like, ageing, and because a lot of people, once they get over about sort of 55 or 60, they're old. And I keep saying, no, you're not. It's just that you don't have enough to do. People must have something to do. But it's hard now. I mean, if they don't have good health, then, of course, they can't do anything because they can't. But, you know, if they're perfectly healthy and their families are grown up and gone away, and then go out and do something, anything. Go walking, go playing golf, go whatever they like, go to the theatre. So that's what I'm keep saying. Keep active. Keep active and keep your mind active as well. It's very important. So this is keeping me on my toes and hopefully I'll keep you on your toes for the next 40 minutes or so. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. 40 minutes! Oh. It'll, it'll fly, boy. <laughs> it'll fly, it'll fly. So let's get right into it. Um, your racing career started in 1959, but you were working as a dress designer before that. And then amateur rally driver, um, bigger pitched up a shop in Dublin and invited you on a rally. Um, and you've, you've not seemed to look back kind of since. Was there... Did you always have aspirations of becoming no, a rally driver? not at all. Not at all. No, my dad had a garage and he used to race in a very amateur capacity. I mean, he'd have to make his own cars and they'd be really fast for the first few laps and, and then they'd blow up, and, which is a shame because he was a very good driver. My brother was a very good driver as well, but without money. I mean, even to this day, if you don't have money, <laughs> you don't get a good car and you don't go out and win and then you don't get any sponsorship. So it, it really is one comes before the other before the other. But no, it wasn't that. I, I, you see, when I was 15 and the nuns just said, you know, to my father, she's stupid. And my dad, who I was the apple of his eye, and he said, nobody's called, especially nuns, because he was a, a Protestant. And <laughs> he said, nobody's going to call my darling daughter stupid. But the nun then tried to explain what she had meant was that I, would, I had plenty of brains, but I wouldn't use them. I mean, there are certain things I enjoyed. Geography I loved, which stood me in good stead afterwards, and English, maths. But, I mean, when it came to geometry and this sort of thing, who 
confused as geometry. <laughs> I didn't even know what they were talking about. Irish, of course, was through everything had to be Irish, Irish, Irish. And there was only one sentence I ever learned, and that was on will Cothagon, Dolomach, Marche, the Holler, which means I want to go to the loo. So I they say, Oh, go on, go on, go on. So I'd get up and I'd come back at the end of class. So, so you're that, a little bit of a mixture then. Just for the Irish class. If you don't understand something, I mean, it's like when I look at the computer, I don't understand anything. I went for all these lessons and this woman said, now you do this and you do that and you do the other. And I'm sitting looking at her eyes wide open and then she comes over and she says, Rosie, wake up. Because behind my eyes being open, I'm actually asleep. Not one bit of it is going in it. But then I guess if you're, if you're passionate about something or you have you know, a natural ability, you are more inclined to put the effort in and work. And that's kind of what happened with the, the rally driving. It was something yeah. that you were good at. Now, your first time behind the wheel, um, do you want to tell us, do you remember the first time you, you got behind the wheel of a car? And well, did you feel like this is something that I'm good at? Or No, no, no. My dad said, you must learn to drive and you must learn to swim. So the first time I was about 13 and in a field, I hastily had not on the roads, I mean, he had enough sense not to do that. But, um, and I, I learned up there and very wet. He, he liked to take me out when it was wet because it was so slippery. And, uh, you know, it would slip and slide. And, he did. and of course, in those days, the steering wheel was about this size and I had to sit on cushions to see over this sort of thing. But no, it, was, it stood me in very good stead. And then uh, the swimming thing uh, he made us do as well, just in case either we fell into the some sort of water or else somebody else did but no I enjoyed driving and when I was 16 because in those days you just went in and you said you know I want a driving license certainly <laughs> write it down and you're, you were meant to be 17 and of course my mother was there and she was like you're not only six shut up <laughs> so you had an illegal driving license I had for the first year nice but, but you're fine you're fine now it's all above board well, after all these thousands of years later, I'm just, of course I'm, it ju is. I'm just checking. No, 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 no. Perfectly legal. No, I... Well, you see, initially you got a 10-year licence, and then the next thing, the older you got, then you got a three-year licence, and then you get a one-year licence. So I'm still waiting for the one year. I have the three years still, but I'm not quite sure whether I should have the three or whether I should be one by this stage. But well, I drive, you'll have a driving licence anyway, either way. Please, goodness. But, you know, I, that's one thing that I am advocating for now, that people get um, upgraded in their drive the older they get. Because an awful lot of people, they have no idea of the rules of the road. Because for, when they start it initially, now I don't want them to start calling it a driving test. No, just to go driving and then for somebody who is a, a tester or a... a a brush up, so to speak, of exactly, their skills. Exactly, and say, do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? Fine-tuning. Well, I did a, a talk out in um, Leopardstown, and it was, you know, the older people and people driving and not driving. And I asked one person, I said, do you know what a ghost island is? Total blank. <laughs> a ghost island? What? So I said to the rest of the room, there are hundreds of people there, and I said, do any of you know what a ghost island is? And in the whole room, about five people put their hands up. But you see, these are things that should... They're all on this speeding, speeding, speeding. Oh, it's the be-all and end-all of everything. It's not. Not knowing your rules of the road, not knowing really where you should be, and not knowing which lane you should be in. It's quite dangerous out there. But do you have... so? Is it easier for someone like yourself who, or would you actually consider yourself someone at the start of your career to have natural driving ability? So yes. I know it's, it's, it's yes. you know, because you've been behind the wheel for so long. Yeah. You, you... But my dad came out with me in the beginning and he would say, because he knew it, and he'd say, now, keep slightly left, blah, blah, blah. If you're turning right, indicate and you move over. But, I mean, he was great and he was very, very calm. But when I'm teaching, I'm, I'm very calm. If I'm sitting beside somebody who's trying to drive quickly, oh, I'm a bundle of nerves. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he can't do that. No, he shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> but anyway, that's... Was, was your dad supportive when you decided to um, take up, like, go for rally driving as a potential career? Oh, no. People... no, it wasn't a potential career at all. It was this woman who came in to me for clothes 
and uh, she had various navigators before this, and uh, but then she knew I could drive. So she said, we, now she didn't ask you, would you like, she said, we are going to, it was down to Kilkenny, and we are going in a rally. So I assumed I was going to drive and she was going to do the navigation. But it didn't start like that. She said, you're navigating, and she was doing the driving. And, I mean, even to this day, maps. You know, every corner I went around, the map went as well, which you don't apparently do that. You go up and you... Anyway, I did everything wrong. So after about... And we ended up in a farmyard. <laughs> and Yeah, we did. And then she, she just said, get out of this. I didn't even know the word she was using. She might have been talking double Dutch because we didn't have uh, bad words, bad language in our house. My dad just didn't allow it, end of story. But uh, so eventually she said, you get in and drive. And I did that for the first oh, probably eight or 10 rallies. But then when she came to the end, I had to get out and she'd get in and she'd drive in over the ramp. <laughs> now I didn't mind because it was just, I just enjoyed it. And it was, you know, Saturday or Sunday and it was great fun. So, I mean, and it didn't cost very much in those days. I mean, petrol was one and six a, a gallon or something, you know. Right. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. But that's just life has changed. Everything has changed. And, like, going from dress designer to to being the behind the wheel, did that, that raise a few eyebrows? It's something so different, even, even now. Um, but in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, it's still... Oh, it was... It was uh... I mean, it was really not heard of, basically. There were very, very few women even driving cars, <laughs> nothing to do with rallying or racing. But no, I, I didn't really care what other people thought in that way. I just enjoyed it no end. And it was just great to get going. And, and you know, I loved it because if you're on public roads, you've got to keep it. But on a rally, and they have a start and a finish for what they call a special stage, so it's blocked off to all, all other traffic and uh, you can go as fast as you possibly can go. But the first few rallies I tried to go too fast and then this man said to me, very nice, and he said, uh, Rosie, have the courage to go slowly. And I'm sort of looking at him thinking, you're meant to be going as fast as you can. But he was so right because the more experience I got then, I, you know, I wasn't putting it into ditches and into hedges and what have you. And it just came to me, I said, you know, he was so right. You must, in anything you do, take it easy in the beginning. And then, you know, when you get more experience, then you can go as fast as you are capable of going. And when you were first entering into that, the, the motorsport world, was there many people that kind of took you under the wing and kind of showed you the ropes? Or were you like on your own, lone, women on the cor lone woman on the yeah. course? Basically, I was on my own, except for this man. And he was a very good driver himself, a very nice man. And he sort of tried, you know, to tell me as much as he knew uh, as what I should do. But, you know, you learn very quickly. You go out either to tootle around and they'd say, as they used to, bloody women drivers. And they still do nowadays. I, can, I say it about them sometimes too. But, um, no, it was just, and th the quicker I got, and then, you know, a lot of the other boy dicers, no, they weren't, they were good drivers, they, they, they were rallying, and then they were saying, you know, this dolly bird out, what does she think she knows about, and these sort of disparaging remarks, and I, I didn't care, I just loved it, the, the freedom, you get into a car, you shut the door, and away you go, and hopefully you're, you know, you don't meet a cow around the next bend in a country road, which people have, to, I've done it as well. You do that sort of thing. So like minced beef? Well, it's just, more? you know, and especially things like the start of Ireland, which was a very difficult event. It had 63 special stages, which is unheard of nowadays. And um, How long would a stage be? It could be anything from about seven miles, maybe, up to, well, over Sally Gap, or down in, in Killarney, you'd have the, um, you know, all of the very long, they could be 30, 40 miles. But it, it depended on what sort of a rally was, whether it was an international, whether it was a, you know, a, a sort of what we'd call a national rally. It could be any. I mean, when we did London, Mexico, uh, it was one special stage was 1,600 miles across, uh, right, like from one side 
right across to the other side. And how, how long? How long did would the London Mexico? It was seventeen thousand miles. How many days did that take you, roughly? Uh, uh, not all that long, because we drove at night as well. You see, they don't like doing that any longer. You know, there's very few night rallies. So would you? Uh, well, how long would it, would it would a break be during the day, or would you get two hours and keep going? No, no, no you, you just one of the stages was. Uh, it was. Uh, what was it now? It was 60 hours, 60 hours, and that was in the Andes. But you see, if, if it was things like that nowadays, it would be on every paper, in every magazine, on every bit of social media. But like back then, they sort of said, oh yeah, yeah, 1600 miles across there. <laughs> you know, nobody sort of, well, I certainly didn't think very much about it. I thought, yeah, that's a bit of a distance, all right. <laughs> but you just keep going, and you keep it... going, and you keep going. Because the one thing I'll tell you, and this is what I say to everybody, even now to the youngsters, to the older people, you know, put your mind to it. You're going out there to win. You know, I didn't go out there just to play around. Because, I mean, when I started and eventually ended up that Delphine let me do all the driving and she did the navigation. But... You know, people say, oh, you take it too seriously. Well, I said, doesn't everybody? I mean, to me, that people didn't take something seriously, I couldn't understand. I mean, if you're going to go out in a competition, why are you going out there to mess around? And Did you think that they asked you that because you were... Do you think they would have asked the male rally drivers the same question? I don't know. I never asked them because it really didn't worry me one way or the other. I went out... You know, and especially if you're driving a car for one of the factories, which I did after a very short while, after about a year and a half, two years. And they only want you if you're going to win. And if you can't win, you know, sit on the bonnet and dangle your legs. That was my sort of thing. You know, that's what the, the company said. And uh, so if I couldn't win, then they might as well get some publicity some way. But you, you have tasted quite a bit of success. You've got oh, some... Yeah. But I went out to win. That was the whole point. And I wasn't letting anybody deter me about, oh, well, you know. And one time when the car really, one of the rear wheels <laughs> fell off it and it went rolling off down the side of a mountain somewhere in Italy. And uh, the girl with me, my co-driver, she said, oh, well, that's us out. And I said, it is not us out. So down the side of the hill, collected the wheel and the, it had a stub axle or something. Now I know nothing about cars, let me hastily out. <laughs> No, seriously, not the mechanical end of it. But anyway, just when I was carrying it back up, and this farmer came along, and he said, oh, you know, very, blah, blah, one minute. And he went off, and he came back with the welding torch. And he actually put the stub axle back in where it should go, apparently, and welded the whole thing. There were a few nails in it and a bit of metal in it and so on. And we went on, and we actually won. And But that, I... I I find it very difficult to give up. Now, if I put it over the edge of a cliff, well... Which you have. Oh, which I have, yeah. But, but you see, if you let it worry you, then you won't do it again. So and you I, you're, don't think about it too much? Oh, no, not at all. If, you see, you can't go out. I mean, no matter what you've done, what any of the girls are doing now, look at the girls riding racehorses. Now, I have the greatest admiration for them. How they do that, I, w I could not do that. I, even when I was very young, I couldn't have done that. And they're going out there and they're showing the lads up right, left and centre. You know, Rachel, what was her name? Her brother, Paul Townsend. Rachel Townsend was actually, I think, sort of nearly beating him for the jockey's championship. You know, this sort of thing. I think that's just brilliant. I really do. But that is very dangerous. But they don't go out and say, oh, this is very dangerous. Oh, oh, I've got to be, I'll get out of the way of the other horses. They're in the middle there and they're pushing and shoving with the best of them. I think it's kind of echoing what you said. I think the, your will to win and your desire to either get to the finish line or cross the try line or, you know, get there first. It far outweighs the, the fear factor. I think you just, you do shove it to one side and don't think about it. Yeah, but I mean, if you were to, because some of the roads now up in the Andes, I mean, they were 10,000 feet up in the air and this type of thing, and the 
you know, <laughs> a significant drop, <laughs> very significant drops. So, I mean, first of all, I'd never look at them because obviously, you know, if you look down, you might get a bit lightheaded and think, oh. So you just go and you concentrate on the road. And a lot of these roads, they were just gravel. There was no way that they were uh, sort of beautifully done out tarred roads, not at all. And in on the London, Mexico, uh, my co-driver, Alice, she got out of the car and uh, Luckily, we had gone three up on that trip because it was so long. And what, sorry, a three up? What, what does that mean, Rosie? Two navigators. Well, a navigator and two drivers and somebody who also can drive and navigate. Okay. So Alice, anyway, was the, the navigator, the official navigator. And we had a fan belt come off on the top of, of one of the Andes, way up in the air. And uh, we got out and then... Uh, Jimmy Greaves was on the same event. He was the footballer, if you remember, and his driver. And they f helped me get another fan belt onto it. So when it was all done and ready to go on, and Jeanette, who was the other girl, she was there. And where was Alice? And Alice wasn't anywhere to be seen. And I said, but there's nowhere for her to go. And then we looked, and there was this little, she was only tiny, little green bush standing beside us. And what had happened was, she was covered with cactus flies. Now, they're very like grasshoppers, but they're much bigger. They're about that size. And they were all over, everywhere, face, head. It, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So I started to try and knock them off her. And of course, they were just sucking her blood out everywhere. And the only thing I could think of was the fire extinguisher. So I took that and I sprayed her up and down. It was only after I was told it could have burnt every bit of skin off her, but luckily it didn't. So they all fell off on the ground. She looked as if she'd a very bad case of measles. So she was just stunned. I mean, she, <laughs> she didn't say a word. So we put her into the back of the car and we had still um, about 40 hours to go before we, our next halt. And she was unconscious. So we said, oh, too bad. So we strapped her into the back of the car and we kept going. And then when we got near La Paz, no, it wasn't La Paz, it was somewhere else, it doesn't matter. Peru somewhere and uh, we got to the top of the mountain and it was just after 12 midnight and when we got there the guards were out saying no 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 it is shut now it is shut because up to 12 you can go down the mountain after 12 you know they're coming up the mountain because it was very narrow I mean it was like Mall's Gap down in Killarney so I said but we can't I said my friend she's dying they didn't understand a word I was saying anyway but um so I reversed, and that was that, and they thought I was going to go and park up. So, and this is a wooden barrier right across, and we had a kangaroo sort of bar, you know, it's like a bar. It helped to keep the stones out of the engine and that sort of thing. So I just put in first and, and went at it, and the guards jumped out of the way straight through, because it was only wood, so it smashed in bits, and we started down the mountain. And because I thought she was dying, I really thought she, at this stage she'd blown up. I mean, she really, she looked as if she was 12 stone in weight. And now she was about six when we started, seven maybe. So down and down and down. Jeanette had her foot on the horn. It's one of these foot horns. I had all the lights on full blast. And uh, it took us probably three hours to get down the mountain. And when we got down towards the end, then these big trucks started, they were coming up. But they must have heard the mad women are on their way down, so be careful. And uh, they were very good, actually, and they'd hoot at us and wave and so on. So we got in at 3 a.m. into this uh, very large city. There was an ambulance waiting and one thing and another. So they took her out straight away out of the car, still unconscious. And I didn't know whether she was, she was dead or alive, but I, I said, well, we'll just take a chance. <laughs> See, this is what I'm saying, because if, if we'd had to leave her, then we would have been out of the event, and we'd gone about, at that stage, 12,000 miles or something. So they took her out, and we had a, an overnight halt there, well, from 3 in the morning till, I think it was 7 the following evening. And uh, Jeanette said, you know, I think possibly she's not going to come back again, so we could be out of the event. And I said, well, we'll wait and see. And just before... About an hour before we were meant to be taking off the next evening, little knock on the door, and here is poor little Alice, still looking like she had a dose of measles, being held under the arms by two of the porters from 
the hospital. And she said, and she was great. She said, well, I knew that if I fell out, then you'd be out of the event and that wouldn't do. So again, Grant, wrapped still in the hospital gown because her clothes had been cut off her and everything else. So we just put her into the back of the car again, you know, tied her in, gave her a bottle of Lucasade with a straw on it. And when a straw gets, it was, a, it was not a straw straw, it was like a plastic tube. So that, you know, Grant, so, but have you tasted a warm plastic tube out of a bottle of this Lucasade? Ugh. Anyway, but that's kept her alive for the next about day and a half. And then she gradually came back to herself again. And then we got to San Cristobal, which is the, we went up the Panama Canal and we had a, a sort of a, an evening and a night and then midday the next day, then we got up the other end of the Panama Canal. But the lovely captain on this, the, the ship we went on, he decided, because all the Israeli drivers were coming along, that he'd have a fancy dress party that night. No, I mean, really, everybody wanted to go to bed, but a few glasses of something and into fancy dress. I think we went to bed again about three o'clock in the morning. Mad. I mean, totally mad. And then it was only from there up to the finish, it was about 5,000 miles. So that was, you know, short enough. Guatemala and, and all these various places up the west coast of uh, South America. And then it went on and on and on. I was getting a bit tired by this stage. And we kept talking. Which is fair enough. I, I think that's, yeah. you know. But again, it was, I'm getting there and I'm finishing. That's the, yeah. you know, and that was my thing the whole way through life. Whatever happens. Because you, you're, if, if any of the listeners don't know already, you have an autobiography mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. Driven, mm -hmm. and primarily that the first half of the book, it's a lot of these amazing anecdote mm -hmm. and stories that mm -hmm. I think sometimes, like the way you're very casually just throwing them out there, but for, for myself, they're amazing, mm -hmm. amazing stories mm -hmm. and amazing memories to have. Um, like I, like I would strongly recommend everyone grab a book Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we have to, we've, we've covered so much. We, have, we haven't even touched on your wins or anything yet, but we want to make sure um, that people that are watching the show to check out, um, to check out a, a video that you're in on YouTube. So it's the ultimate test drive. So we're going we're gonna to cut to that now for, um, for our viewers, if everyone wants to have a listen. You're pretty badass in it, by the way, Rosemary. It's unbelievable. I'm not, I'm not even. I'm not even upping it. It's like it's all truthful. <laughs> we've, we've, the producers and stuff. We were watching it before as well. So uh, yeah, enjoy. Have a listen and let us know what you think online. I think when you're good at something, why should you give it up? You've got to go out there with this fire in your belly. Can I get out? Ooh. You have to have passion. <laughs> Unbelievable video there, uh, Renault Ambassador. Uh, how, how was that actual experience? Well, you see, this is when I was asked to be an ambassador for Renault and uh, I was at a dinner and I was sitting at the Renault table and this lovely little Frenchman sat beside me. Oh, gorgeous. But you see, when I stood up, he disappeared here somewhere, but that was by the by. Anyway, and he was asking me what I did and so on. And I had said that I was, you know, Monte Carlo Rally and East African Safari and going on about all this sort of stuff. So he said, oh, you should drive a Formula One someday. And I said, ah, yes, yeah, sure, why not? And so then left it, went off, whatever I was doing. And about uh, three weeks, maybe a month later, I got a call from Paddy McGee, who's the CEO of Renault Ireland. And he said, I hear you're going to drive a uh, Formula Renault. And I said, I am. I mean, after a few glasses of wine, you could ask me to fly to the moon and I'd say, oh, yes, why not? But anyway, I said, 
really? And he said, yes, will you do it? And I said, of course I'd do it. I mean, I, I didn't hesitate. I, I'm ridiculous in that way. So then it started, and what size was I, how tall was I, what size driving suit, and all this. Then I sort of thought, this is getting sort of serious. And then I got all the schedule that it was flying to Marseille, and then we'd be picked up in Marseille, and then you went up to this beautiful, it's the French Grand Prix track, Paul Ricard. And I was really getting nervous at this stage, I can tell you. And luckily I brought a friend of mine, June, with me, and she was very calming. So. I went in and then I, I met Alain Prost, who was World uh, Grand Prix champion for oh, a number of years. And then Jolien Prost, who was, uh, sorry, Jolien Palmer, he was also a Formula One driver for Renault at the time. So he was trying to, you know, tell me how this worked and that worked. But it was only when I got into the suit and then sort of got into the car itself and I had gone around the track in a Clio just to see where the bends were. Then they put me into what they call just a, a Formula Renault, which is, a, it's, I think, 600 brake horsepower or something. And uh, so I had to try that out. Everything was fine, but the thing is that it, the steering wheel, it's not a steering wheel, it's a, a little thing shaped like this. It's a little kind of D or... Well, yeah, now it's changed again, but the, the, yeah, it was... The gears are yeah, at the back at nearly. At the back of it. And I, is this up or is this down? Oh, dear God. So anyway, that was all right. And then they put me out in the Formula One. And the manager of the track said, if I don't think she's capable of doing it, she is not doing it. Typical French man, she is not doing it. So he went out in a car ahead of me. And then I went out in the big car. And uh, he came in and he said, yeah, she's fine. Let her go. But... It was an experience because when you got there, there were about 50 people. So I automatically thought they must have more things going on that day and so on. No, it turned out there were timekeepers, mechanics, this dup, 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 the whole entire lot, drones, helicopters, ambulances on every corner, doctors. Oh, and then I really got nervous. But anyway, the morning was nice and bright and you know, everything else, the sun shining, lovely track. And the only one thing that I, I still always laugh at is on the side of the car they had RS and on the tarts they had RS and on everything they had RS. And I said to the PR man, I said, that's very good. And even my uniform had RS on it and the, the helmet had RS. And he looked at me as if I'd come down the last shower and he said, hey, RS. I said, yeah, Rosie Smith. No, he said, Renault Sport. So, you know, that, that didn't help very much. I felt such an idiot. <laughs> but anyway, they all laughed, so it didn't matter. Uh, and then I just went in. But what was nice, just before I went out and the mechanic said to me, and you, you have a neck brace on, you must have a neck brace now, and then the balaclava and then the helmet and then bits in your ears and all, stop. But he said to me, now that red button down there, and I, I put my hand out to it because I hadn't seen a red mm. button. And, I, and he said, don't touch that. And I said, what's it for? He said, well, if you crash and bur burst into flames, pull that. Right, so that's something uh, that you don't want to Thank you very much. That was really nice of you. <laughs> but then the other guy said to me, I said, look, they're difficult to get off the line. They, they, he said, Jeremy Clarkson was here and it's, they stalled it and stalled it and stalled it. And I said, I knew it was a half wit anyway. But I, I did a show with him and I, I really didn't. We did not get on at all. He was very, oh, oh, so scathing about everything, women drivers especially, you know, this sort of thing. But he had stalled it time and time and time and time again. And I said, if I have to get out and push it away from the start and finish. But uh, no, it worked very well. I didn't stall it, much to everybody's amazement. And I did all whatever laps it was around. And then when I came back into the pit lane to go into the pit, um, the entire crowd were out. I have a lovely photograph and the entire crowd were out and they were all clapping and cheering and one thing and another. So then I could relax. And then we went straight up to the restaurant and my my regular co-driver, who still, you know, she comes with me on a lot of things. This is Pauline. Pauline Gallagh. Mm. And they'd flown her out unbeknownst to me because she lives in Bristol and uh, she was there. And uh, so we went and drank 
copious amounts of red wine and, and ate this, that and the other. It was brilliant. That, that was the nicest part of it. But the only disappointing thing about it was that uh, the Guinness Book of Records were to have come out and they said no, because I was 79 at that stage, and they just said, no, she'll never do it. So we're not wasting our time or our money to send somebody out. And that was the, la the second time that I was really disappointed because uh, the other one was the longest um, reverse trip. That was down in, uh, up the Khyber Pass, which is, I think it's about 73. 50, 53 miles. Yeah, well, 73 kilometers oh, or something. Yeah. yeah, it was a long way. And of course, the you reversed the, in the entire way here because we couldn't have got. We were out of the event at that stage, if because the pistons had burnt out, uh, purely because, you know, they had put, they had high tuned the engines, which they shouldn't on a very long trip and over the deserts and so on. They should never have done, but they did. And there were about six works cars. These were the Lotus Cortinas, and. Uh, there were, and I think I think only one of them finished. Well, we finished, but I mean we didn't really win anything because, you know, we we were so slow and you know having to go backwards up that amount of miles, um, that was a bit slow. Well, I, I can well I, I actually because I have seen your reverse mm. before. Mm. Um, there was you were in near Marion Square. And uh, it was we were doing something with uh, pep talk. Oh yes, and yeah. I had saved a parking oh, spot yeah. for you. <laughs> um, so it was it was, quite, it was quite a it was a big enough parking spot. Then some car behind moved, so it was a tight enough job. And I was worried that I'm not too sure your car is going to fit. I kind of appointed to it, and then in one smooth fluid movement, a reverse parallel park at some degree of speed and just slotted right in and you popped out of the car and I was like, oh, oh, she still has it. <laughs> she still has it. So, yeah, reversing 72 kilometres. Yeah, it was a long way. It was a long, long way. And you've got, like, Monte Carlo rally in 63. That's, uh, like, so you have so much experience driving in Smart. amazing events, like the, mm. the Pac Khyber Pass in Pakistan, just along mm. the Afghanistan mm. border, mm. Mm. Monte Carlo. Do you have a favourite... Do you have a favourite rally that you've raced? Well, I think one of the, the, the best was the East African Safari Rally. It starts in Nairobi and it's run in three, sort of like a shamrock like this. And you go back to Nairobi, you know, two and a half days later. But we started on, I think it was the Thursday evening. And I mean, it was just, the weather was appalling. It rained and rained. It hadn't rained there for I don't know how many months before this, but it rained. And it's a thing called gumbo mud. And when it gets wet, it goes really bright orange, starts to colour my nail polish nearly. And, but it's very sticky. So if you stop, you can't get going again. But the people who owned the car that I was driving, they said, if anybody's in your way, just knock them out of the way. I mean, they didn't care whether I'd bash this all over the car. It was keep moving. Keep moving, regardless of what you do, you keep moving. But you no, know, th th that was a very difficult event because then we came somewhere and the, as Pauline said to me, there's a river and we're going to cross it on a wooden bridge. I mean, it, literally it was one of these that sort of swayed around mm. the place. But because of the amount of water that had come down, it had been, you know, it torn away. So I said, are you sure now? Are you? This is it. This is where we should be. And so, on. well, I said, Pauline, get out of the car and walk in there and see how deep it is. Oh. In the middle of Africa. <laughs> I said, you're absolutely, you know, I said to myself, she's nuts. But good lover, she went out and I had all the lights full on so I could see if she disappeared or was eaten by a crocodile. I'd have to do something about it. But luckily she wasn't. So she came in and it was only actually up to her ankles. It wasn't too bad. So she got back in the car and I said, right, we're going to take a rush at this. So we rushed through it, got through it, got out the far side. It was quite wide now. But anyway, so we got out and that was that. And then another time I saw a pink elephant and I slammed on the brakes and she said, what are you doing? I said, pink elephant. No, again, this was all at night. You see, you're at your lowest ebb between about, you know, two and four or two and five. Especially if you're driving for that yeah, period of time. Yeah, time, yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, that was it. She said, no, pink elephant. Now, pink elephants get pink because they roll in the gumbo mud. And then, of course, when they dry out, they dry out a much paler pink than 
this. Yeah. So went down another one, another, oh, another pink elephant. Slam on the brakes, <laughs> no pink elephant. So I said, right, now the next time I'm not being caught with this. And uh, went on down another pink elephant, so I drove straight at it. And poor little, stop, stop, <laughs> there's a pink elephant. <laughs> but, you know, silly things like that happened. And but did you ever, in all those pink elephants and uh, bridge mishaps, was there ever a thought of, you know, stepping out and doing something else or, or retiring from the sport? No. Well, I did purely because, and it is in the book, because the husband left and then the house was being repossessed. And in the long run, I, I really lost everything. So I had no option because, you know, when you're sort of in a business like that, people expect you to always look your best and have the hair done and so on and so on and so on. And I just didn't have the money. And, uh, oh, no, at one stage, I mean, really at my lowest ebb, and there was, um, I went back to the house, I had no electricity, I had the two dogs, and I had a bottle of, uh, not a bottle, a box of Maltesers, and Blackie got one, the other, the German Shepherd got the other, and I got the other, and this is what we did. And it was a lovely house, but it had a little fish pond out of the back. And I did look at the fish pond, and I thought, you know, I could go out there, go face down. I think it only takes a minute to drown. You can drown a very little bit of water. So then I thought, well, why should I? Set the whole bloody lot of them. I'm going to carry on. And uh, so that, that day I decided, now what, can, see, what could I do? I could go back to dress designing, which I would loathe. So I decided, because my sister lived in America and all her children went to driver's ed. And that's, I said, what a great idea. That's what I'll do here. So I had a very good friend. Actually, the book is dedicated to her. And it was in a dedication to my friend, Pat Duffy, Pat Doyle. But she died bef after they'd printed it, and she died before it was actually out. But anyway, she lent me money to get a car, a second-hand car, and I, I started the school. That's over 20 years ago. So, I mean, it just went, and then when the people started to hear that I was back out again, and I was doing this, that, and the other, and then I started getting more drives, and... You know, it was just, it was difficult for a long while. And then, um, do you cross many, like, what kind of people would you get at your, at the school? Well, they're all youngsters. They're all, well, not all of them, no. I have very nervous drivers, and, but mostly I did it for the school children, like the transition year here, or the 15, 16 year olds. And I think it's a very good idea to start on private ground and learn the basics of driving you know, and the gears and the, the different pedals and all the rest of it. So that when they are old enough and they have their learner's permit, which they must get, and then they must do X number of lessons and this sort of thing. But uh, no, I just, it, it went very well. The schools, either we would go down to the schools down around the country or they'd come up to Goffs, which is near Nace. And uh, no, it's worked very well. And do you, do you look at driving and, and teaching is you know something that's fundamental and it's very important for youngsters anybody to learn but for yourself driving was that kind of nearly like you spoke earlier about you shut the doors and you don't think about mm. anything else mm. except getting from a to b mm. is that how you still look at driving it's a no get no, out of your head? no that that would be only when i was racing or rallying i shut the world out but if you've got a youngster who has never done anything before and she's, you know, he, she, and the clutch, and hopping off it and stalling it and one thing and another. That's why I say I'm very calm when I'm doing that. If I'm out on the road and people are acting the complete idiots because they don't know anything about which lane they should be in or how they get onto a roundabout or off a roundabout, then I, I do get annoyed. But I'm usually on my own so I can say what I like <laughs> and I can mouth at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you're you're also doing so you've got a pretty hectic schedule so firstly thanks for taking the time to come in here today but you're also doing a little bit bit with 20 by 20 and they're doing a lot of talk now about hero your hero um you know speaking about who it was that you looked up to or up to when you were younger mm. do you have anyone that comes to mind like I know you spoke a little bit about your dad is there oh, yeah well my, my dad was basically my hero because he was so calm and he encouraged me every inch of the way and, you know, he really was 
uh, he was just brilliant. He was brilliant. But as far as like outside people, I admired Pat Moss because she was rallying when I was sort of just going into it and she was nearly coming out of it then. But she was so good. And I just, I, I sort of said, if, if she can do it now, then I'd follow what she's doing. And, and she used to talk to me about the thinking and the, the psychology behind it, basically, and this type of thing. Now, I loved her. She was really terrific. And she was very nice to me because, as I say, I came in after her. And she was still, I mean, she was still at her peak. But she sort of gave me little bits of information and little tips about this, that and the other, which I thought was really very good of her because, you know, it, it, there are very few people that, you know, A, that you would listen to sort of way back then, but she was so sincere about it. She's Sterling Moss's sister. Sterling is still alive. He was Formula One, but um, Pat died a number of years ago. But then everything Pat did, Pat used to uh, show jump. She was in White City in London and she represented England in Olympics and this sort of thing. So, I mean, she was an all-rounder. She was really brilliant. And do you, I remember I was, um, I met you a, a, while, a while ago now at this stage and I was talking to my friends at the, uh, at the table and her, um, my friend's mom Anne, overheard. Mm. She's mm. like, Rosemary Smith, the rally mm. driver. And her story was, she was living in, um, she, was a, she was a child at the time. She was living in a small village in Gal Galway or Mayo. And you were in the middle of a rally, parked up the car, um, to use their bathroom and had decided to pick this small, so kind of bolted in, mm. all eye struck and then bolted out again. Um, and they were, that they still talk about that now, this uh, I'm sure pee I break said. in Galway. <laughs> pee break pee in Galway. Pee break in Galway. So oh, thanks. <laughs> but I think it's great because you were clearly here and a lot of just women, um, people looked up to you back in the day, but it's first you going on, shows and, and people now know who you are and what you've done and the amazing things that you've achieved. Do you think you're a hero for different generations as well? I know you probably... Well, you see, first of all, being very honest, I never thought I was a hero. I never. When I won something, I was very pleased. But, uh, I mean, uh, this thing of when somebody wins something and they pick up the trophy, and I said, kissing tin gods, what are they doing? Just say, thank you very much. Shake hands with whoever it is. I don't like that sort of thing. Now, I was so bad at one stage when we were winning a lot, I would send Pauline up first to collect the awards. I was so shy. I couldn't do it. Just getting up there in front of all these people. And, no, it was dreadful. And what, what was, was there, was there a change or a flip the switch where you were... Yeah, so, my a mother bit more died. Sure for my mother died, because I mean she was lovely and adorable. I, I just didn't get on with her very well, and if you asked me a question, she'd answer. With the result, I never spoke. I was totally withdrawn, and uh, we did a few things on. I don't know, you, you won't remember, but it was with Mike Murphy, and it was uh, whose baby, and my mother was there. And then all they had were these little tiny pictures of us, there were about three or four of us. Eddie Macken was one of the other ones, he was the show jumper. But just these little, and whose mother and, you know, whose baby and this sort of thing. And Mike Murphy was doing the sort of interviewing and all that sort of thing. But the parents were only meant to say a yes or a no. Uh, is she a sports person? And my mother said, well, I suppose you might. <laughs> Jane, would you please keep quiet? <laughs> you have to say yes or no. And of course, then they'd ask another question. She said, oh, but wait, no, no. <laughs> Jane, please. <laughs> she nearly had the whole show put off. Now she was, but she was like that everywhere we went. You know, we, we got on a plane to go to America one time and all the Black Rock College uh, rugby players and their coaches, a man called Jack Arrigo, I'll never forget it. And it was just after I had won something and we were sitting up front and my mother said, oh, there's Jack Arrigo, I know him. She used to actually, I think, go out with him or something. She stood up and said, this is my daughter, right down the whole length of the plane. Oh, my God. I was mortified. And with the result, we, I just couldn't get on. I mean, she was the nicest person in the world, I suppose. But, you know, you don't have to get on with your parents. But I think the fact that I got on so well with my dad, that really she was a little, her nose was out of joint a little bit. But anyway, those days are gone now and 
what's next for what's next for for Rosemary Smith? Well, next week I I only came back from England late last night, and then I was out at the Dorky. It was for Bernardo's uh, car show. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And next weekend now I'm back to England again for the I'm president of the Tiger Club in Great Britain. So I'm going back to there do. And then the following weekend, we're doing a race in Mondello. And then the following weekend... Oh my God, your schedule is giving me anxiety. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's full on. It is, absolutely. But you wouldn't have it any other way? No. No, because you see, if you have a family around or if you have... You know, I've, I've some absolutely brilliant neighbours, I must say. I never had neighbours before. I, I lost my house and then I had to rent this little one. But these neighbours are just... They are just fantastic. So they're always around if I need them. And my one thing that I, I really miss are my dogs. But I can't. I'm away too much. I wouldn't because I live on my own. And there's no way. I don't think it's fair on a dog. And people say, well, why don't you get a cat? But I said, if I'm not there for the cat either, he'll, he'll do a wander. You know, dogs will just pine. But cats will wander. But anyway, no, it's going on. It's good that I'm back to England again to do a rally in Wales. And then I'm, you know, oh, the deja vu is at the end of August up in Donegal. That's going over all the, the really nice passes up in Donegal. That'll be good. So I have a 4.7 litre Sunbeam Tiger for that. That's a big one, big engine. So we'll have to we'll have to keep an eye for you up in Donegal. We'll have to keep an eye out for the autobiography. I'm sure you're going to grace our television screens at some stage in the future too. I've but, done a few now already. Yeah, you've but, done, yeah. no, no, you've been yeah. you've been pretty good crack on all of them. Ro Rosie, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. It's uh, great. It's great having you and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what's next around the corner for you. Thank oh, you. Oh, my bus. I'm driving a bus. Oh, she's. <laughs> I forgot that. Sorry about that. Now. Yeah. Explain the bus. You're going to have to explain the bus before we leave that. Well, there's, they're trying to recruit women bus drivers. And they reckon that if they have somebody who is a driver who will come down and talk to them or whatever it might be. But then they said, would you drive a bus? And I said, well, I've tried most other things. So Formula One, <laughs> double-decker. <laughs> oh, no, not a double. Oh, no, I wouldn't want that. Though they say a double-decker could go right over like that to 45 degrees and it won't fall over. No, I'm not going to try that. No, thank you. Okay, so no double decker. No, but you're on a bus at some stage, a small one. Rosemary Smith, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. That's all we have time for today. Massive thank you again to Rosemary Smith for joining us. Just in as well, uh, Neve McAvoy has managed to uh, score a goal uh, in the Dublin versus Kerry game. So Dublin are on their way to a semi-final. I have to say this because Mackers would give out to me if I didn't mention that she's uh, bagged a goal. She gets a bit frustrated <laughs> with things like that. So she's you meet Macker <laughs> next time you're on. Um, thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you next week.